Some 25 years ago, when I was in my mid-40s, uh, I was a standard regular MD in New Zealand, becoming increasingly frustrated by my inability to help patients. And I heard about various organizations in America, one of which was AMPS, that became ACAM, and I think it was in uh, November 85, I first came over to San Francisco and um, attended the first conference. I never felt more inadequate in that I suddenly realized how little I knew. But also I met a man called Hal Huggins and for the first time realized that um, doctors, MDs, need to look at teeth. We're not supposed to look at teeth. And demarcation isn't restricted to building sites. And all of a sudden, I started looking at teeth. Now, at that time, I also had amalgam fillings myself, and I was also into big game fishing. In New Zealand, we have uh, some quite good fishing. And um, I was eating an enormous amount of big game fish, marlin, tuna, big kingfish. Um, and I was feeling pretty stressed out at times and having bouts of tachycardia and my short-term memory was getting pretty grim. Uh, we still had the quaint customs in those days of house calls, and if I had a house call at two in the morning, I knew I had to write down the name and address of the patient before I put my clothes on, and twice I'd forgotten the piece of paper at home, and I had to go back home, pick up the piece of paper, find out where I was going. This was a little bit disconcerting for somebody in their 40s. But when I met Hal and started looking at mercury, I realized that I was uh, hell-bent on poisoning myself. I stopped eating centimeter thick slices of smoked fish and um, had my amalgams removed. I bought his book and um, one of my patients was the wife of an electrician. Uh, I knew pretty well because he used to come fishing with me. And Liz had terrible migraines, usually twice a month on average I'd have to go to her home with a syringe of petadine. And she came to see me and I said, hey, let's look inside your mouth, Liz. And sure enough, there was a whole heap of amalgam. So I gave her Hal's book and said, read this. She did exactly what you're not supposed to do. She picked up the phone and rang the local dentist and said, Dick, I want all my fillings taken out. Well, by some incredible uh, divine uh, stroke of good luck, nothing went wrong, and that was the last migraine she's ever had. And this kind of got me hooked on to looking at patients in a different way. And I guess it was just as well that I didn't know what I was embarking on then, or I might have been a bit more reluctant to do it because it's been an interesting journey over the subsequent 20 plus years. As I've put here, um, all the regulatory agencies say that there's no problem with amalgam, uh, the ADA, etc. But you know as well as I do that uh, there is a problem, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Back in 86, a textbook appeared which uh, put me on the right track. Um, Levine and Kidd, um, talking about oxidation and free radicals. Now, I didn't really know much about, or I didn't know anything about free radicals until I started coming to conferences over here. And um, this is what we're basically talking about. Um, this is stuff that you know. I'll just quickly go over it. Um, the WHO has told us back in 91 that um, it's acknowledged heavy metal toxin, and there is no level at which it can be re regarded as safe has a strong affinity for sulfhydryl bonds, phosphocarbonyl groups, etc. And Fritz Lorscheider uh, has told us about that, and others. Um, it's synergistic with lead and with cadmium and with other metals, including aluminium and zinc. Chemical companies are very careful to only test one product in isolation, but we know we're, see, we're swimming through a sea of chemicals and toxic heavy metals. In fact, every single one of us 
if a fat biopsy was taken and sent to the EPA, would be declared unfit for human consumption. There's no doubt about that. Um, we know that mercury is an accumulative metal. Small doses like arsenic will eventually make you ill. Binds to cell membranes. It depletes glutathione. Um, we know that uh, the whole glutathione selenium uh, complex is involved in our anti rusting or antioxidant system keeps us alive. Retention toxicity, um, I think Boyd uh, is one of the ones, Boyd Haley, one of the ones that started really putting us on to the idea that um, you have some people that very small doses will accumulate and they retain more than others and eventually that can make you toxic. And if you look at the normal tests hair, urine, etc., you won't find it. And the, the ones where they've got the lowest level in the hair are at highest risk if they're exposed to mercury. And of course, in New, in New Zealand, we have a huge selenium deficiency problem. And um, it never ceases to amaze me how difficult it is to get my profession, let alone uh, policymakers, to appreciate selenium deficiency. There are three main mechanisms. Um, you know these. We've got Fenton reactions, we've got the sulfhydryl groups and glutathione, and we've got the fact of selenium deficiency. And all of these basically are linked in uh, the potentially carcinogenic uh, mechanisms. And right at the end, I want to cover that again. One of the bizarre things about mercury that I've found is that in medicine, if you've got somebody who's exposed to a known toxic metal, let's say arsenic, lead, cadmium, nickel, even copper, you can show they're exposed to it, You're, you can show that they've got symptoms, you can do standard tests to show they've got elevated levels in their body, and then it would be negligent not to treat them. You don't have any problems. You make the diagnosis, you treat them. However, I found that when it's from mercury, from amalgam, all of a sudden these things don't apply. And I've helped several patients try and get claims from insurance companies. We've gone to court. And each time they've been turned down on very clever legal maneuvers. So in the end, I wrote to the National Toxicology Group in New Zealand and said, please give me criteria that are acceptable. Because there are criteria for all the other metals, you must have criteria for mercury. I got a letter back from the top toxicologist. And he said it's very difficult and he'd like to see evidence of organ damage. Problem is, there's a certain amount of consumer resistance to brain biopsies. So <laughs> <laughs> they just don't want to know. And that's the fact. It's commercial, it's political, it's financial, but in essence, they don't want to know. And one of the problems is that the symptoms tend to be non-specific, as you well know. Chronic fatigue, depression, short-term memory loss, leading towards senile dementia. And a lot of other things, of course, it affects cardiovascular system, etc. Um, these can be caused by other things. And lawyers are very good at getting so-called experts who can show that this is caused by that, this is caused by that, as well as by mercury, so there's no proof. And I had a lot of patients, most doctors have a lot of patients in the middle age group that have these symptoms. We know that mercury affects the central nervous system in a major way with limbic dysregulation, the limbic brain sitting just above and behind the nose, um, affecting temperature regulation, sense of calmness, um, etc. But also it affects the blood. 
The haptin formation binds the cell membranes. It also reduces lymphocyte viability and redu reduction oxyhemoglobin. And for both of those, I can thank Hal Huggins. And I've been pestering Hal for over a decade to get something published on this. And um, of course, it affects the liver and uh, bowel with dysbiosis, uh, with resulting in a lot of, sort of unclassifiable illnesses. But let's look at the, the white blood cell for a minute. Back in the 50s, the normal reference range was between 5,000 and 9,000. Quite a wide range, but by 2000, they'd shifted it to 4,000 to 11, and I understand now in America, it's 2,800 to 12,500. They're continually widening the goalposts, as we call it, because otherwise they'd have to say that too many people are not well. We know that too many people aren't well. The actual healthy one is far closer. It's actually between 5,000 and 6,300. This is an adaptation to continual toxic exposure. This paper came out this year in Explore. Some of you may have seen it. Hal Huggins has finally got something published. They did a lymphocyte culture and exposed them to levels of mercury found in the blood of people with amalgam, so-called safe levels. On the fourth day, there was an 80% reduction in viability. This meant that 80% of the lymphocytes were just floating around doing nothing, including in your blood. This would include the natural killer cells and things like that. Now, when the lab does a blood screen, all the white blood cells are dead. Obviously, they've been pickled in alcohol and fixed and stained and stuck on a slide. They assume they were alive when they were in you. But I imported a co-oximeter, second-hand one, from the States some 15 years ago because Hal was doing this routinely. I mean, it's a $20,000 piece of lab equipment. I got one second-hand for $5,000. Um, and I did 30. And in every single one of these, the lymphocyte viability was way down. Sorry, the oxyhemoglobin was way down. And this confirmed that both what Hal was saying, that the oxygen level in the blood is impaired, and also that the lymphocytes are non-viable. This would affect a person's overall, overall health. So we know that the major source of mercury is dental amalgam. We know that large numbers are placed every day still in the USA, although I've heard just recently that um, amalgam-placing dentists are in the minority for the first time. This is, in, this is incredible. 48% now and dropping, which according to Charlie Brown puts them at increasing risk of malpractice. Great. Now, in New Zealand, in 1968, there was a health department survey of young people, and 21-year-olds at that time had an average of 16 fillings. And I've seen a number that have had 22 fillings. Not unusual. And of course, Mark Richardson, his study for Health Canada, uh, showed not only that uh, the average mercury retention was deemed to be 17 micrograms a day, but that some were getting 100 or more. And they based that on eight amalgam fillings. So the 16 surely must mean that they're potentially being exposed to an intolerable amount of mercury, and we should therefore be looking at the symptoms and signs of chronic exposure to mercury. There's a typical New Zealand mouth. I see, have been seeing for a couple of decades. Now, 
1998, there was an interesting paper published in the New Zealand Dental Journal called 40 Years of Dental Caries by Betty De Liefde. And I was, when I heard this paper was coming out, um, I got one of my dental colleagues to uh, give me a copy because I was curious as to know how they were going to uh, redefine a memo that went out from the health department to every single dental nurse and dentist in New Zealand in 1976. And this memo said, only drill into teeth showing decay. Strange memo. <laughs> but one year after it came out, one year after it came out, there was a 30% reduction in the number of amalgams paid for by the health department, and that dropped to 62% within five years. It had nothing to do with fluoride. It meant that 62% were being done prophylactically. Dental nurses, especially, were drilling into children's sound teeth that had maybe a natural deep groove, making a hole and filling it with amalgam to prevent it getting a hole. It's called prophylactic odontotomy, and that's why there was an average of 16. The problem is that we still have that middle-aged cohort of 1.4 million New Zealanders between the ages of 40 and 70. So that's what they said in that paper. Changes in dental practice were instigated, resulted in a significant reduction without elaborating on what those changes were. We know that there's a condition called olfactory limbic kindling, where repetitive small doses of especially solvent volatile chemicals can um, increase the sensitivity of the limbic brain. And that's what we're, the area we're actually looking at. Volatile chemicals, including mercury, has access through the roof of the nose, through the cribriform plate, up retrograde passage, up the nerves. It also goes through the mucous membrane of the mouth as well. And of course, this is the area where we have all the trouble. Paper came out uh, in 2003 which I thought was relevant in that it showed severe reductions in metabolism in the hippocampus and mammary bodies, etc. This is the limbic brain in early uh, Alzheimer's. And this reflected limbic dysfunction. And we know from Boyd Haley and others um, that rats exposed to mercury vapor at levels found in the mouths of people with amalgam, just for two weeks, um, exhibited the sort of lesions that we find in the Alzheimer brain. And of course, there was a Diana Echevier's paper with a potion in FASEB, um, pointing out much the same thing, um, memory loss, impairment in um, logical reasoning, mood swings, irritability in fatigue, diagnosis because we haven't got any acceptable tests for it, rely predominantly on uh, clinical awareness or cumin, I like that, it's an old term. Um, I found that these patients often have chronic candida and problems because the mercury is killing off the commensals in the gut and candida is mercury resistant. They often have um, cold hands and feet and tap tired all the time. Um, and of course, different degrees of dementia. Um, these tests, the blood and urine tests, are only relevant for acute exposures. Um, and we had to use provoked or challenged tests, as the potion has shown us. And I also use, I'm fortunate enough that I can use, I've got a Mora, had for 20 years, uh, EAV diagnosis, which helps. So what I started to find was that the symptoms in my patients were the same as the manufacturer's data sheet and the same as what was published in FASEB. But of course, toxicity doesn't depend just on exposure. You've got to really look at the person's ability to excrete versus accumulation. And we have to look at, in fact, in genetic inheritance. Um, this was the potion paper that um, endorsed the use of DMPS, 
I started using that um, much the same time and have done probably nearly a thousand DMPS challenges IV. My first little paper on this came out in 94 in the ACAM journal. Um, we had 80 symptomatic patients, of course the urine, unprovoked urine, virtually negligible amounts, and then we gave them an IV bolus of 250 milligrams DMPS and checked the next urine, and we had an average of 320 micrograms, anything over 50 is deemed significant. I persuaded 10 dentists to um, do the same thing, and I think it's mixed dentists and dental nurses, and their level was uh, 340. They only had an average of six fillings compared to an average of 12 in my 80 patients. One of those dentists um, who was in the same rotary club with me, he had a level of 700. And I remember the next week uh, at Rotary, I said to him, Tony, you've got a hell of a lot of mercury in you. Um, and I remember him thumping the table and saying, there's nothing wrong with me, right? Nothing wrong with me, nothing wrong with amalgam, showing a bit of mercurial irritability. <laughs> Sadly, five years later, he had to give up his practice because he was no longer competent. He was shortly after admitted to a nursing home he died two years ago, aged 59, from Alzheimer's. And I then found out that he was one of the staunchest promoters of amalgam, and had in fact joined in a group who had lodged a complaint against me, the Medical Council, on the mercury issue. It was rather sad that um, he suffered the consequences, you might say. It took me ten years, uh, sorry, two years to find uh, ten controls who'd never had amalgam. They were average age 48, so they weren't kids. And I had to cheat, in fact. I got a couple of um, uh, um, Taiwanese who were living in New Zealand, so they hadn't been born in New Zealand, but they didn't have any fillings. Now, I was involved with um, production of a government-wide paper in 1994 for the health department, um, Human Health and Dental Amalgam, I'd been pestering ministers of health. Um, every new minister got a barrage of correspondence from me. And Jenny Shipley, who was minister at that time, finally decided to do something, so she, she got this white paper organized. She made the logical mistake of thinking it was a dental matter. So the lead author was director of dental research, second author, director of dental services, and then me. I was the only one that had any clinical experience in amalgam toxicity. The others went through it because they'd been paid, but at least it gave me an opportunity to put down some of the facts, and because it dragged on until 1996, I managed to also include the Health Canada's um, advisory, and that did have some effect in New Zealand. But the director of dental research couldn't philosophically accept my concerns. He said, we know that amalgam is perfectly safe. Dr. Godfrey's patients must be all neurotic women. Um, and the way to disprove it is to have an independent, randomized investigation. And he asked a lecturer in psychology whether she would do it. And Linda Jones came up to see me and said, could you provide a computer list of um, all patients you've seen um, going back two years because Dr. Kutcher has said that nobody who's seen me in the last two years should be interviewed because of placebo and it would have worn off after two years, not that it lasts that long. But we gave her a list of 400, I think it was, and she contacted 180 randomly and guess what, 95% of those that had fulfilled the, the full medical and dental protocol had had major long-lasting health benefits. And that was published in 2004 in neuropsychiatry. Uh, I never got another letter from Wellington to say, um, yeah, Mike, you, you actually are onto something. But yeah, that's life. Now, thanks to Boyd, when I was over in the States some time ago, and he told us about 
the relationship between mercury and Alzheimer's. A couple of papers have come out from Duke's University, from Alan Rose's, showing that there was a blood test that could identify people who are at increased risk of early onset Alzheimer's before the age of 70. And this was the APOE. And APOE4 from both parents uh, meant that you had a very high risk of getting early onset Alzheimer's. And this is uh, from his 1995 paper showing that 2% of the population, it's 1 to 2%, have the 4-4, and they have a 70% risk of getting Alzheimer's under the age of 70. If you have a 3-4, about 20% of the population, you've got a, your risk goes back 10 years. If you have a 3-3, which is most of the population um, here, you, you've got to live beyond your 80s, and if you have a 2, you've virtually got no risk. But they said it is a mystery why this happens. And several papers came out over the subsequent years that also said that it was a mystery. Uh, one of the papers by Laws and his group looked at um, sub-Saharan Africans and said, hey, those with 4-4, in Africa don't get Alzheimer's, but those with 4-4 in America do. And could it be something to do with the diet? Well, when our, second, when our paper came out, which I'll show you in a minute, um, we said that Africans in sub-Saharan Africa don't get amalgam. They do in America. <coughs> Boyd Haley showed me why there, what he explained the mystery and he said it's quite simple if you look at the chemistry in that the APOE2 has got cysteine in two places. The 3 has got one cysteine and one arginine and the 4 has got two arginines. And arginine hasn't got the sulfur bonds that combine to mercury. Therefore, looking at the chemistry, one could um, surmise that if uh, mercury is underlying cause for the dementia, if you can remove it from the brain as fast as it comes in, um, you're less likely to get neurological damage. This is just showing another, in another way the relationship of the number of APOE sulfhydryl groups and uh, if you've got the four, um, if you've got the two rather, you've got four sulfhydryl groups, if you've got the, the four from both parents, you haven't got any. Together with Damien Wojcik, um, who's a family doctor up in Fongare, um, about four hours north of where I live, we started to put this together. Um, Damien initially was referred to me by Mary, his wife, because Damien thought he was suffering from burnout, but Mary, who'd been to me earlier as a patient, said, hey, now you're showing all the symptoms of mercury problems. So Damien came to me and sure enough he had amalgam and we dealt with that and he got a new awareness of um, not only how his own health had improved like mine had, um, but he also started looking at um, people's teeth. And it's quite amazing if every GP uh, did the same the changes that would occur in general practice. At any rate, we put this all together with 400 patients complaining of um, clinically mercury toxic CMT. And we compared our ratio of E2 to E4 with the four papers that had been published. Wardell's study was actually done in New Zealand looking at blood from blood donors. And that was the part of the original research that developed the APOE testing. Then there was Alan Roses and Stuart, and then the Laws one that I mentioned earlier. And if you look at ours, um, you can see that we have a far higher proportion of the E4 compared to the others. So the whole thing was skewed to the right, which supported our concept that the mercury was linked to the APOE and the uh, incidence of chronic mercury toxicity. Damien continued 
to look at this in a big way in his general practice, because I'm no longer in general practice, uh, although I, I do see patients, so I've been moving into other fields. And eventually we looked at 1,200 general practice patients, those suffering from clinical metal toxic toxicity and those that didn't. And the age, this is the age distribution. As you can see, it's mainly in the, um, the middle decades, um, the 40s to 60s. One thing we found that was intriguing was the high proportion of women. Um, and I've, I've noticed this right from the very beginning that um, women suffering from chronic fatigue and mercury problems outnumber men three to one. Um, and I'm still not quite sure why, because if we look at the other end of the age spectrum, the autism groups, then boys outnumber girls four to one. Anyway, we put all this together and submitted it to Neuroendocological Letters, and it was published uh, last year, where we looked at three common things. Uh, we looked at memory loss, we looked at depression, bipolar disorders, we looked at chronic fatigue syndrome, so-called ME, and also uh, compared irritable bowel and Crohn's. Um, now, depression was defined at having at least six months of antidepressive treatment and being under the treatment by a psychiatrist. Now, as you can see, the memory loss, there is a, 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 a slight progression as you go into the E4-4 group, and there is um, chronic fatigue syndrome. It's not quite such a mark, but it, there's also a progression. One thing that we found that was intriguing was that if we looked at the irritable bowel and especially the, the, the Crohn's, they were all in the E2 to 3. And what we think is happening here is that these people, because they're able to excrete mercury, and the main excretion is through the gut, via the liver, that's what was causing the irritable bowel and Crohn's. And if you look at some of the German textbooks, medical textbooks, um, they, they talk about Crohn's being caused by mercury. This is um, a comparison of the patients that didn't complain about mercury toxicity versus the ones that did. And um, as again, the blue are the ones that are mercury toxic, and there's a higher proportion once you get into the E3, E4. Uh, mean symptom score versus healthy controls. Um, this is the, those with um, all of the chronic mercury toxicity ones. The second column um, in the general practice patients then, we've got um, the general practice patients that weren't complaining. The symptom score, by the way, was taken from a questionnaire that's very similar to the one that you use, the IOMT. These are patients without amalgam, and this is a group of uh, police recruits because Damien is a, uh, a police surgeon, so he does medicals on uh, presumably very healthy young men and women. Looking at the memory score itself, and um, we, could, we did a bit of a comparison on treatment because some patients um, did the full protocol, some didn't, some used homeopathy. Um, we could realize that patients weren't all local, so we were dealing with patients from all over the country, and New Zealand's pretty big, uh, stretches a long way in all south. Um, we attempted to do uh, full protocols, and if we look at this, um, the untreated patients, the follow-up was at least 18 months, by the way, um, those that had amalgam removed and nothing else, their, their loss of memory score was, um, was, was worse. Um, full protocol with DMSA afterwards, good improvement, but we also found quite good improvement with those that had homeopathy. Um, 
those that had DMSA without anything else, without amalgam removal, um, they seemed to deteriorate. Fatigue score, um, again, as we expected, um, good improvement when they did the full treatment, good improvement with homeopathy. A lot of patients had a combined, um, and again, nothing, no benefit of just having amalgam removed. And this is what I try and impress on patients. Look, having amalgam removal is, is you know, quite, you've got a basin that's overflowing. Removing amalgam is turning the tap off. You've still got a basin to empty. They tend to understand that. Depression score, again, uh, very significant benefits from doing the proper protocol. And those who are untreated, did worse on follow-up. And the overall mean symptom score, putting all things together, we got really good improvement by the full protocol, little else. We did a, um, a urine mercury challenge on um, a few hundred. Um, not all patients wanted it. and. Um, Again, we found a highly significant level of mercury. Uh, the challenge we were doing was a straight IV push of 250 milligrams, five uh, of um, DMPS, and um, the next urine that was collected, usually between one and two hours afterwards. Now, it's obvious we're heading for a a huge logistical problem um, because we've got, first of all, to get approval of this, that it is a condition which is going to involve um, the leaders of both professions and the politicians, but then you've got to train them. And I guess that's why you're all here. Um, in New Zealand, we've got the NZAONT, which is a small branch um, affiliated your organization. Um, but we've been struggling ever since I founded it a decade ago or so because the members are all working flat out as you are and it's very difficult to get uh, others to join because there's no incentive really. Uh, you have to wait until somebody becomes aware that um, they are health professionals not molar mechanics. Um, a lot of dentists feel very threatened, scared, um, because they're worried about being sued, they're worried about being able to practice even. I'd like to just show you some of the relevance of knowing about the APOE. We'll start with this here. This is the so-called index case. Now, this was a boy of nine who had been diagnosed as ADHD at age three. He had reacted violently to his vaccinations, and his parents had stopped them after the 15-month one. And he was a patient of Damien's, and we because we were doing APOEs at that time on just about everybody, uh, we found he was a 4-4. So Damien started backtracking. The mother had been under Damien for some time. Um, uh, I think, the, yeah, the, the boy was probably around about seven when the family moved to see Damien. He'd been treating the mother for depression. She'd had apparently had toxemia with both her previous pregnancies, and Damien had started treating her with DMSA to lower her level of mercury, and she became pregnant again by mistake, and um, she didn't have any toxemia with the third pregnancy. Now, the second child, that was before they met Damien, uh, she was a girl, age seven, She'd be, she was al always very, very angry, irritable. She'd also reacted badly to the vaccinations, and so they, by then they were more aware, and they stopped hers after the three-month one. 
and she was a 3-4. The father, he'd been diagnosed as having Asperger's and he'd suffered from an encephalitis in 2002 after he'd split off the part of the farmhouse to make a calf rearing shed um, with the chainsaw and um, the calves all died after being moved into it because they were licking the paint and this was a lead encephalopathy even though the, the hospital hadn't diagnosed it. He was a 4-4. Four, four. The mother was a 3-4 so the kids all had to be either 3-4 or 4-4. Four, four. Go back another generation grand, uh, grandmother, uh, chronic depression, fatigue, irritable bowel, basically um, Alzheimer's and she'd had a level of 372 after DMPS challenge and they knew that the great-grandparents, great-grandfather had been um, ADHD all his life. He'd married an Italian war bride, they didn't know anything about her. So we've got the genetic pattern going down. The, the third child that Damien delivered is now three and she's a happy, gentle little girl, no vaccinations of course. Going across onto this side of the family, heads into Canada, and we haven't done any tests there, but the same thing, we've got Asperger's, um, and this branch here, the mother and the three children all became chronically fatigued um, in 1998 after having the house renovated. What's the betting that there was lead there in the paint? So there's some wonderful opportunities for medical detective work in, in this field. Unfortunately, um, as of earlier this year, we can no longer get the APOE blood tests um, subsidized by the state. The labs are now asking that we pay them. Uh, it's $140, which is a lot cheaper than it is in America. I understand it's 300 here. Now, just before I finish, I want to cover what I'm now involved in, have been for the past five years, because it's yet another extension of how dentistry is involved. This paper came out in Neuroendocological Letters last year where they looked at the metals in 20 breast cancers and compared them to eight benign lesions and they found highly elevated levels of nickel, chromium, zinc, iron, mercury and cadmium. And some of you may know Vera Stayskal um, I've known her for I think, 15 years and when she showed me the manuscript of this before it was published I said, hey, all those metals are used in dentistry and she said, yes, aren't they? Um, I'll just go back. Right. Um, I was over in uh, Germany in May um, to speak at a conference called The Emerging Role of Metals in Chronic Disease was the theme of the conference. It was attended by 122 scientists, dentists and doctors from 22 countries. Um, I spoke to a professor of dentistry from Zurich who said that in his opinion dentistry will have to be metal free in the foreseeable future because of the risk of malpractice. I've been doing breast thermography for nearly five years. I find this an incredibly sensitive way to identify breast cancers long before they can be detected by any other means. And I have one of the best cameras. I've now got two of the best cameras. When I finished the first thousand patients, which was last year, we looked at the data and 430 were normal, which meant that there was virtually no chance of them having cancer. 570 were abnormal, 81 of them had or were previously proven breast cancer. This is what I found. 99% I mean, of the patients had amalgam, uh, the others had dentures, but in the normals, 6% had root canals. 
rose to 28% in those with abnormal thermograms and 44% in patients with cancer. Sevenfold increased incidence. This is grounds for concern. There may be something that's not very good for health if you have a root canal. Now obviously there are people going through life with root canals who are perfectly all right. And we haven't yet got a really good test to show whether somebody is being adversely affected. Although Boyd Haley's um, topaz uh, does help with some sort of uh, degree of accuracy as a chair side test. Um, I use my, my Mora as well to try and confirm it, but um, at least patients I think are going to have to be informed. It's like playing Russian roulette. If you've got one root canal, it may be one bullet in the chamber. If you've got two root canals, that's two, etc. It increasing the odds of something going wrong. Here's a familiar picture to most of you. This lady, 53 years old, she had breast cancer. Six root-filled teeth. Four of them happened to be on the breast acupuncture meridian. So what are her chances of not getting cancer? She also had amalgams and crown and bridge. And that x-ray was passed by a top dentist and oral surgeon as being okay. But hey, even I can see the problems here, here, and there, plus all the metallurgy. Here's another one. Breast cancer, four root filled teeth, 13 amalgams, and three crowns. Huge problem. I get a patient with an abnormal thermogram that's deteriorating. She's heading towards breast cancer, and, and they've got that in their mouth. What am I supposed to do? Because it's pretty devastating to the patient to think that I'm going to get breast cancer unless I have all this dealt with. A huge, huge cost, psychological as well. Let me just show you what thermography is. That's a completely normal thermogram, 52-year-old lady, 53 years old, um, breastfed children, completely normal. Black is cold, then shades of blue, yellow, red. Bit of thyroid problem up there. Completely normal. There's right-sided breast cancer. Stands out like a sore thumb. There's another one. That lady had completely normal mammograms and ultrasounds. In fact, in the end, I went to the radiologist and I said, if this woman hasn't got breast cancer, I'll sell the camera back to America, $40,000. They got a bit worried and sent her for an MRI, and that picked up the cancer. And there's another one there. But this is where we can combine the two professions. Completely normal. She happened to be one of my staff. Um, all my staff are female for some reason. And um, when I got the camera, everybody had thermograms done. Two years later, I suggested we ought to do them again. And we got a nasty surprise in this nurse. Um, she had a very nasty looking right breast, which was Typical, in fact, of a DCIS, a disseminated uh, ductal carcinoma. Um, the nipple temperature had gone right up to over 1 degree, 1 1.3. So we in intervened. We instigated measures which consisted of removal of a root-filled tooth. Had to be on breast meridian as well. She had her amalgams removed. She went on vitamin C selenium, dim, mulliman, homeopathic. Three months later, looking better. Six months later, looking even better. Nipple temperature down to 0 0.3, so it's normal. So before March, it was that. And one year later, it was that basically by including some dentistry and a few other bits and pieces, but the main thing was dentistry. 
So we've got a tool here with thermal imaging that can make um, inroads into the commonest form of cancer in women. I'd like to finish with, Wally, I discovered a deadly safety flaw in our product. Who should I inform? No one. The stock would plunge and we'd have massive layoffs. Your career would be ruined. But my negligence could cause the deaths of a dozen customers. The first dozen is always the hardest. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.